Welcome to the show. Watchtower has been taking nonstop L's this week with huge setbacks for the religion in Norway, Pennsylvania, and Washington State. A devastating documentary in the UK has led to increased exposure, and Watchtower has responded by releasing responses and videos that are as culty as humanly possible. All of that and more all on today's... Hey everybody, my name is Jake. Welcome to the Sunday service, the, the Sunday wake and bake stream. And by wake, I mean it's 1 o'clock p.m. where I am, <laughs> but uh, we are chilling here. You can see my bed head, which isn't all that different from my normal hair. Um, and this is a live stream, folks, although one that will remain on the channel, I, I do believe. So if you want your comments to be featured in what has been described by some as a channel that exists, uh, comment your shit might be on the stream. That reminds me, there's usually a lot of cursing in the live streams, and it's a little bit less structured, although we're aiming for more structure today. Um, we're going to kind of have a serious news half of the show and then a fun half where we're going to cringe along with uh, some really culty and unfortunate videos. So, uh, we have some celebrities in the chat, and to, to kick things off, uh, I, I'm going to highlight a comment from Software NPC, which, uh, who has a great channel, uh, really, really great videos. Be, be sure to check out their channel. Hello, Jay, can you please comment on the Rebecca Vardy documentary and how the witnesses responded to our understanding Mrs. Vardy herself has never been one of Jehovah's Witnesses? Yes, indeed. We are going to be talking about all of the goings on going on. And uh, part of that is this documentary that just aired in the UK. Uh, we're going to start, though, with a bit of uh, news that was a surprise to me. Uh, if I can share my screen here, uh, I, I logged on to avoidjw.org because I wanted to talk about the Norway ruling, and I saw this, this little headline here, my work here is done. After almost nine years of religious human rights activism, Jason Wynn is retiring. Uh, this is a, a really shocking announcement, but also, you know, nice. Obviously, uh, Jason Wynn is the owner of this website. AvoidJW.org is the biggest compendium of Watchtower uh, materials on the internet. It has absolutely every Watchtower elders letter <laughs> publication they've ever done, PDF scans uh, in, in multiple languages as well. So this website is absolutely incredible. It seems like Jason's taking a well-deserved uh, break. And it does clarify at the end uh, that although Wynn is leaving activism behind him, the work of AvoidJW.org will continue. It is imperative that members and former members have access to confidential documents. Every single member of Jehovah's Witnesses has a right to due process. This is only achieved by having full knowledge of the procedures that are laid out in documents that are kept secret from ordinary members, particularly women. So, um, yeah, that's that. That's definitely a big announcement for the the ex Jehovah's Witness community. I, I'm so glad to hear that this particular website will continue to be up and running because it is an excellent resource. And uh, in particular, I wanted to highlight the uh, news that is you know new as of like a couple of weeks ago. Um, oh boy, I had it, and now now it's gone. But basically, in Norway, Watchtower officially lost their religious status. They are no longer considered to be a religion. And uh, <laughs> that's a pretty big deal. So they are no longer getting government subsidies. They are no longer getting free money from the government. And uh, you can watch the interview that I did with Jan Frude. Nilsson uh, on the channel where he kind of lays out the stakes of all this and, and how it all came about. But it, it is pretty huge. Watchtower uh, is going to, this is all going to go in some trial um, 
which I think is going to take place in January. So this is all going to continue to drag out. But right now, they, they are not getting free money from the government. So that is good. That is incredibly good news. And Jan uh, was incredibly instrumental in that. But Watchtower's response to this uh, was pretty low and horrific, even by their standards. Um, Jan Fru Nielsen has uh, become quite a, a public figure in Norway. And this whole back and forth between Watchtower and the Norwegian government has played out in the local media, the local papers. Watchtower has published responses in these uh, periodicals. And following the news that they had lost their religious status and all that, um, Watchtower responded by releasing an article that was basically, I guess it wasn't from Watchtower itself, but the local paper did this huge multi-page long article about Jan Fru Nielsen's dad uh, from the point of view of his dad. And it is incredibly upsetting. Watchtower basically, you know, was able to convince Jan's dad to go to the press and give this, I, I don't know, re attempted reverse expose where, you know, he talks about the fact that he's not actually forced to shun his kid and, you know, he's disappointed in what's happened. Uh, it's really, it's really upsetting. Uh, so this is a low blow, even by their standards, I thought, and I, I don't want to dwell on it too much, but, you know, even though um, it was a largely sympathetic article, the journalist behind it <laughs> did ask uh, some hard-hitting questions, and, and the answers were revealing. Um, so that is one thing that is happening. Another big thing that is happening is in Pennsylvania, a grand jury, and this is receiving a lot of press in the Pennsylvania area now that a local news team did a, a little documentary about it. And it's only like six minutes, but it's it's really good. I figured we could watch that. I do want to take a moment to shout out everybody in the chat. We have uh, Stitch Aru. We have Deanna Dion. We have Canadian Girl 4. The Canadian Girl 4. I'm so sorry. Fire Soul Rockers, the old world of Rena. That's quite a name. And of course, we've got Mimi. We've got Dante Gichi Bailey. <laughs> we, we've got all sorts of people. We've got viewers from Italy. We've got viewers from Canada. We've, we've got a real potpourri. I don't know. Is that a word? <laughs> and low, the, the pun master general in chat. So let me let me pull up this um, local news. XJW Caleb. Uh, check out his recent stream. He just did one on a video that I believe we're going to be watching later today. So I haven't watched it yet because I didn't want to steal any of his points or Harrison's points. I believe it was a joint stream. Kim Barber, VIP in the chat. Okay, so this is the local um, Pennsylvania like Fox station that, that did this. And um, <laughs> it is worth mentioning, you know, that local news stations are, are quite different. Like, a local Fox affiliate is very different from like the Fox News Enterprise, uh, which is probably why a story that is largely critical of a Christian religion was able to exist. Um, and this was front page news, um, which was posted on May 2nd. So I believe last week or so. Uh, let's take a look. Pennsylvania grand jury has recently brought child sex abuse charges against nine men, all Jehovah's Witnesses, in what some are calling the most extensive investigation into the group in history. Fox 43's Harry Lee reveals the investigation that will likely lead to an official report that could have major consequences for the Jehovah's Witness organization. Epic. <laughs> The first time was a Wednesday morning. Martin Hawk was assigning door-to-door -door routes for the Red Lion Jehovah's Witnesses congregation when a teenage member slipped inside the Kingdom Hall with Hawk's four-year-old daughter. I caught him, you know, uh, following my daughter. I didn't know what to do. I actually didn't do anything the first time as I didn't know if I saw that. The second time was a Sunday morning. My daughter 
Martin is somebody you've probably seen around if you're in the ex-Jehovah's Witness community. He was also in another documentary. I don't remember which one it was. There was a few that came out around the same time, but the story is uh, really horrific and uh, is really, uh, oof, I'm trying to avoid using a, a JW specific term, but it is encouraging. <laughs> what else can you say? It, it's encouraging to see that this getting wider attention. Disappeared again for the second time. And I've, freaked out. I was really scared because I knew he was there and I saw him assaulting our daughter. Even so after the third time, for a true believer, there was nowhere to turn. The Hawks relied on divine justice, not secular. Uh, the police are controlled by Satan, the justices. So we can't get justice for anybody out there. The world is lying in the power of the wicked, wicked one. one. In 2005, they reported so the abuse justice. to the elders. This is so great that they were able to get this particular point out because obviously you know, there is a disparity between what Watchtower says the official policy is and the reality of the ingrained culture of the religion. And this is something that often reports like this fail to get into, that the culture of the religion is one of extreme fear and skepticism and mistrust of any outside institution, even if that is Child Protective Services or the police or anything, right? So even though they the policy is actually for the elders to call the branch and inform the Jehovah's Witnesses of their right to call the police themselves, uh, obviously members and uh, – I said members and elders, but, you know, all – members, including elders, are highly skeptical of outside institutions. The whole world is in the power of the wicked one. Not to mention, it'll be interesting to see if they mention this at all, the culture of not taking your brother to court. Uh, so these are all things that it can be easy to miss in reports like this. So, it, you know, imagine if you knew nothing about Jehovah's Witnesses and you turn on the news <laughs> and you see this, you know, that's going to stick with you. But not to police. You're told to wait on Jehovah. So wait they waited Jehovah. 11 years. I wish it was the child abuse that woke me up, but it wasn't. Hawk is now one of dozens of witnesses to testify before a Pennsylvania grand jury that's investigating an alleged systemic cover-up of child sexual abuse within the Jehovah's Witnesses organization. Mm -hmm. The group, also known as the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society, has 8.7 nice. million members worldwide, including 1.2 million in America and 83,000 in Pennsylvania. It was founded in Pittsburgh in the 1870s, breaking with Orthodox Christianity. 83 2000 in Pennsylvania. So this reminds me of, of a story that's at, that's vaguely important, but not really important. What I, I was trying to do, um, I've been emailing some local like journalists and papers over here, but what I wanted was the actual data on how many Jehovah's Witnesses there are in the state of Ohio, right? So obviously Watchtower has that information because they're able to provide it for this. Um, so I called the branch. I called the branch. And I asked, uh, you know, I, I wanted to know how many uh, witnesses there were and or congregations there were in Ohio. And you're like, uh, hold, please. And so a person picks up and they're like, hello. And so I asked the question again. They said, well, that's really a question for the service department. And I said, oh, okay, can I talk to the service department? And they said, well, this is the service department. We, but we don't have... Uh, we don't have that information. And so, you know, I called him out on this. I'm like, well, you know, I see local news reports in, in other states where they have numbers. Anyway, it's really weird the things that Watchtower chooses to be secretive about. <laughs> and so, sorry, this little aside about that just reminded me, like, even very basic information, like the amount of members in a given state, they're, they're weirdly protective of. Over its focus on Armageddon and separation from the world. In recent Ooh. months, Pennsylvania Attorney General Michelle Henry announced sex abuse charges against nine members of Jehovah's Witnesses. We must stand, Michelle Henry. And it's really great that they emphasize separation from the world. That's so good. This, hinting at a larger pattern. Some of these defendants even used their faith communities to prey upon the victims and others had to look no further than their own families. 
Defense lawyer Dan Kiss said his client, Robert Ostrander, was singled out to advance a bigger investigation. Now, I'm a little confused. I'm a little confused here because if you noticed, um, others had to look no further than their own this families. About the lawyer, defense beard. Lawyer's got a beard. This is a man who is not a wanted criminal. Uh, but he has Lawyer a beard. Lawyer Dan Kiss said his client... But then this guy who is a Jehovah's Witness is a predator, and he doesn't have a beard. So I guess I'm confused as to how this is all stacking up, because I was always told that beards mean that someone's bad, and shaved means that someone's good. Uh, I don't know. Robert Ostrander was singled out to advance a bigger investigation. This seems to me, in large part, to be Catholic Church Part 2, they're making this about the Jehovah Witness religion. In February, oh, I asked the, the Attorney Jehovah General Witness if she was him. investigating the organization as a whole. Her response? This is an ongoing investigation. The Attorney General's office says they still can't comment on the investigation, but wrote in a statement, the relevance of the Jehovah's Witnesses organization to the investigation is outlined in the grand jury's presentments regarding each defendant who has been charged. Those presentments articulate incidents where defendants use their positions of authority within Jehovah's Witnesses congregations to build trust with children who they later abused. Now, multiple sources confirm the state attorney general's office is investigating the organization with a report like. You know, when you see a kingdom hall side by side with, you know, these allegations of abuse, you suddenly realize kingdom hall is a very creepy building. It's really not pleasant to look at. I mean, it's the same with churches, right? As soon as you're watching a, a news story about the Catholic church and then you see like stained glass windows in a church, you're like, Ew, I don't know. Religious imagery, no matter how you try to paint it, it's just always a little creepy. I understand there is a grand jury uh, uh, convened on these issues. Uh, from my understanding, that uh, there is a grand jury going on. The investigation. If I ever publish up, a book, I'm going to do exactly what that guy did and have, have it propped up, open, uh, convened towards on the these camera. Uh, from my understanding, look at this guy. <laughs> you know, not to question his motives or anything. Uh, he literally wrote a book about it, but I just, I find that very, very strategic. Saying that uh, there is a grand jury going on. The investigation is wrapping up. Nine Jehovah's Witness men have been arrested for child abuse in the past four months in Pennsylvania, with many more arrests coming. I, my little work has helped arrest some of those men. Sources all. say the rep I wanted to shout out a, a comment here. Mimi says, I hear they're destroying documents. And that's kind of the concern because uh, because of this grand jury investigation, all elder bodies in the state of Pennsylvania are on a document hold. They're not allowed to, they, they have to retain absolutely everything. They're not allowed to destroy everything. But, you know, I always wonder when it comes to stuff, whether it's within Jehovah's Witnesses or some government investigation like well what's to stop people from destroying it anyway i've seen succession you can just burn documents um anyway court is expected to detail jehovah's witnesses internal judicial system and how it allegedly fails to hold abusers accountable there is tremendous abuse in the faith that is intrafamilial uh and so many many victims in the faith have been locked in uh, because they're not allowed to tell the authorities um, and the proof element in the church has been so high so uh it's it's disastrous for an internal investigation watchtower requires two people to witness the abuse a standard that in many cases is impossible to meet in recent years dna evidence can be considered as the Good second point. witness the odds of child abuse including dna evidence especially when you're not uh, encouraged to go to the police right away is almost zero it's not going to happen the Hawks did go to the police in 2017, shortly after they grew disillusioned with the church and left. That that was a really nice uh, thing that they that they called out there. The you know the two witness rule, as we saw in the Australian Royal Commission, they'll try and say things. The, the, the Watchtower leadership, when they're called out on this, will say, "Well, but the the second witness could be the circumstances or DNA evidence, but." Why does one need this rule to begin with? Like, why hold yourself to this arbitrary standard? It's kind of like their standard on blood. You know, they they claim that the Bible is very clear 
about no blood, but also blood fractions. Eh. <laughs> you know, why are there all these allowances and nuances for what's supposed to be some clear black and white rule from the Bible? Uh, there clearly isn't, which exposes how completely arbitrary and unnecessary this rule is in the first place. So also, in 2018, John Logan Hawk, Martin's step cousin, was charged with indecent assault of a person under the age of 13. Jesus. But because John was about 14 years old at the time, the charges were ultimately dropped. Martin That's says he will continue to work with the attorney general's office to ensure what happened to his daughter never happens to someone else's. I would love to see the headquarters held accountable because it is their policy that has led thousands of young kids to be abused, victimized over and over again. Jehovah's Witnesses were. That's so good that they that Martin was able to to say that and that they left it in, you know, that ultimately it is the headquarters that needs to be held uh, accountable because, you know, the elders who are often painted as, as very nefarious. And of course, some of them are, but they are just kind of company men who follow orders and think that following these orders uh, is a requirement for their relationship with God. You know, there's a lot of narcissism and delusion happening there, but the people who make the rules and are capable of actually changing things would be the branch would be the governing body themselves, no matter what happens to a, you know, state of Jehovah's Witness, you know, in Pennsylvania, ultimately the elders aren't able to buck the policy because we also have instances where elders have, you know, decided to take it upon themselves to call the police and then they get uh, deleted as elders, which is obviously worth it. It's not particularly important to be an elder or not in reality, but the, the group will punish elders who don't follow the rules, which is another thing that leads to this uh, cycle of abuse. So yes, the headquarters needs to be held accountable. Responded in a statement mm. that the scriptural investigation does not purport to offer an alternative. Does not purport to offer an alternative process, but it is though. And that's obviously how the members view it. Like, even though it, they are not going to say that it's an alternative process to the secular authorities investigation and blah, blah, blah. Well, they think that they have a higher authority because they think that God's authority is higher than any earthly authority. So the, we'll notice this in a in, in another response that they make to the Rebecca Vardy documentary, where the wording is very, very specific. Um, yeah, they love doing this. Uh, lying, I mean. Alternative process to the secular authorities' investigation of allegations of the crime of sexual abuse. They added that the religion of Jehovah's Witnesses does not shield any perpetrator of child abuse from the secular authorities. Elders will report an allegation of abuse might have been a to the hard statutory the authorities as required by fun. law. Harry Lee, Fox 43 News. <laughs> Martin and his wife have Sporty continued beanies. to work with the attorney general's office as the grand jury continues investigating an alleged cover-up of child sexual abuse within the Jehovah's Witnesses organization. And we should note that while we do not typically identify victims in our reporting, both the parents and now adult victims say it was important for them to share their story in hopes of protecting others. And tonight on Fox 43 News at 10, we look into the legal ramifications for the religious group and why the organization itself self could be held responsible for the actions of its members this is uh, it's a, it's excellent reporting i mean this is what a, a, any story that becomes a national story starts out as a local story and local news uh, is by far far and away statistically more trusted by people than mainstream media cable news outlets corporate media so that was really, really excellent. And we'll see where that goes. I believe Martin posted on the XJW Reddit that there was a front page story in the state's biggest paper the next day all about that as well. So it's it's gaining a lot of traction. <laughs> you know, people in that state, if you are a witness, you know about it. You know about that now. Uh, whether, I mean, in every congregation, the elders know about it. And now it's on the front page of their local paper. It's been on the local news. It's going to be this continuing story. So that's massive. That's going to have ripple effects. It's a small world in, in Jehovah's Witnesses. Everybody talks and, and spreads gossip. And so this is going to gain traction. People within the religion are going to know about this, uh, which is going to lead us to one of our videos that we're going to watch later that I wanted to cover at the time and, and um, just never found the time to do. And I, I think it'd be good to dive into it, the kind of PR that they're doing 
for the members to negate these kinds of reports. Um, and this is this is what it's all about right here. Mimi says, now that my JW sister no longer follows me, I've gotten balls to the wall. I'm posting XJW content. Honestly, it's so cathartic just to be able to like have a curated social media feed where it's like, I don't have to worry about my uncle who still follows me on this social media page. I can just post whatever I want. Um, okay. Now, other things. I guess let's get to the Rebecca Vardy stuff. Now, Rebecca Vardy, uh, let me open this here. Um, honestly, her fame, at least to me, has not made it to, to this state, has not made it to this particular household. <laughs> um, hey, we've got a, a, a real celeb in the chat, which is my sister-in-law. Holy shit. Good to see you. Um, yeah, it does depend on the local news. For example, our local news sucks absolute shit, <laughs> which is why I haven't heard anything from the Columbus Dispatch recently. I guess I shouldn't disparage them while I'm actively trying to get their attention. Um, but anyway, Re Rebecca Vardy, this is apparently somebody who is famous in the UK, not particularly famous stateside as far as I can tell, although I, I could be wrong. Uh, she's married to a footballer, a footballer a soccer player. Um, this is a review of the documentary, but in this, we get Watchtower's response, and this is a good little recap of the um, of the documentary. And I think this was a surprising documentary in some ways because um, Rebecca Vardy had, had talked in the past, apparently, about her negative upbringing as a Jehovah's Witness. But what I think many might have thought uh, would be just kind of a, a fluffy celebrity PR piece turned out to be kind of a hard-hitting, <laughs> damning documentary about the religion that showed a lot of clips of, like, JW Broadcasting and interviewed victims of, of, of shunning, and including uh, a father who I think shunned his child for a little bit. Um, so... Let's see here. I wanted to, yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. So this this documentary uh, happens, right? So I'm just gonna take a quick sip of water, quick sip, and you know, while I'm doing that, let me shout out. Uh, we had a couple super chats come in. Anthony four ninety nine, XJW here, really enjoying your channel, and Mimi ten buckaroo something for the refugee donation box. Uh, if you know, you know. Check out uh, me and my wife's uh, last video on the channel where we dunk on the latest Jehovah's Witness feature film drama. Uh, it's very weird. And it culminates on, or sorry, culminates with the protagonist being stuck in a refugee camp informing a congregation there and hand painting a donation sign that is like the hand painting the donation logo from the website it's pretty it's pretty rough um let's see we could watch it do you know saying she has it on youtube let's see we could just watch it i want to read this little bit because this at least has the uh, Watchtower response, or part of it anyway. So this has part of Watchtower's response to this documentary. Um, so a little bit of context. From the age of 11, her life fell into disarray. Her parents divorced, and she left Norwich, leading to former family members and friends shunning the family. Divorce is allowed only under very limited circumstances. That's putting it lightly. At 12, Vardy was sexually abused. By 15, she was, quote, acting out and was told to leave the family home. She has had very little contact with her family, many of whom are still Jehovah's Witnesses since. The Jehovah's Witnesses deny that shunning takes place, but there are several accounts here from people who have left the church and say that even their closest family members no longer talk to them. One man admits he shunned his own children and was instructed to hang up the phone if they called him. So I love this because it's like, you know, it references the JW defense of it, but also is like, but literally the documentary shows that this is a lie. So fuck off. <laughs> like, good, good. This is literally just a review in the guardian of this documentary. And they're like, this, this is bullshit. Um, 
Thank you, Cubone. Anytime anyone compliments my accents, they get a special shout out because it feeds my ego. Um, well, let's see. Can somebody drop a link in the chat? I'm going to pull up YouTube here and try and find the documentary itself. Um, before I do that, though, or maybe while I'm doing that, let's look at Watchtower's full response, which showed up on the news the next day. I believe, uh, I don't know if it was the BBC, because this was a Channel 4 documentary, so it was, you know, a, a pretty big documentary that was seen by a lot of people. We had somebody in the chat say that even in Canada, it made a big splash. So somebody on the XJW Reddit posted uh, a literal screenshot. They took a photograph of their... TV screen with what Jehovah's uh, Witnesses official statement was. And it says, and the wording is <laughs> very interesting. Courts have rejected the allegation that disfellowshipping and so-called shunning results in social isolation and discrimination. And it is simply misleading and discriminatory to imply that our religion is controlling. <laughs> it's a great statement that is as culty as the allegations. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, this isn't it, Chief. Um, but the way they word it is that courts have rejected this allegation. Not that the church themselves deny it. Not that anybody within Jehovah's Witnesses would deny that this is the case. Because <laughs> this person... Uh, oh, sorry, it was Larchington. So Larchwood posted this, who is uh, a compendium, an encyclopedic compendium of all things JW hypocrisy. Uh, if you don't follow Larchwood on Twitter or or Reddit, where I now follow Larchwood because I'm not on Twitter anymore, uh, they post stuff like this every day. Uh, and this is particularly apt. This is the JW.org FAQ article about shunning. Uh, I know this one because I wrote a rebuttal to it. So I know this by heart. Um, and it's the Frequently Asked Questions article Um do Jehovah's Witnesses shun former members? And it says, we do not automatically disfellowship, well, sorry, disfellowship someone who commits a serious sin. If, however, a baptized witness makes a practice of breaking the Bible's moral code and does not repent, he or she will be shunned or disfellowship. The Bible clearly states, remove the wicked man from among himself. So on the website, the policy is clear. Shunning is a thing. They do do this. And that's, uh, you know, I, I, if you want a, a deep dive into this, I, I did a, a whole video about all the lies Watchtower tells about shunning. And yeah, this is what they do. In public facing statements, they release things like this, which say that shunning literally doesn't happen and you're crazy. You're crazy for saying that. But of course, um, no, just check their website. They absolutely do. And I'm trying to find if somebody... Okay, I think it's this. Um, oh, it opened in another tab. God damn it. Let me show this here. So this is in reference to Self-Aware NPC's comment that I showed at the outset, which is that Watchtower released yet another statement where they say that Rebecca Vardy has never even been a Jehovah's Witness, which is going to be very strange and shocking to anybody who isn't an XJW and doesn't know what kind of absolute rhetorical bullshit they're pulling. So this is, I believe, in the Daily Mail. I believe that's Mail Online. Uh, yeah, okay. So they published in the uh, British trash rag of record, the Daily Mail, to our understanding... Mrs. Vardy herself has never been one of Jehovah's Witnesses. We are therefore troubled at the attempt to link Jehovah's Witnesses with what happened to her and find the assertion that elders hushed up her abuse absurd. Um, so how can they get away with going on the internet and telling lies? How could such a thing possibly happen? Well, what Largewood points out, and I think if I click these, it will literally open another tab uh, again. And Samantha sums it up. Technically, you're not a Jehovah's Witness unless you're baptized. And if any of us who have been baptized know that one of the baptism questions that they make you answer in front of hundreds or thousands of people, depending on the venue where you get baptized, 
because it is a very public event so that there's more shame if you try and weasel out of it later. They say, are you aware that being baptized officially recognizes you as one of Jehovah's Witnesses uh, or something along those lines? So you are technically not considered a member if you are not baptized. But no. Are Caleb and Sophia baptized? No. Do they constantly identify themselves as Jehovah's Witnesses? Yes. That is what they do when they're in school and with their little worldly friends, right? Because obviously you consider yourself a Jehovah's Witness if your parents are Jehovah's Witnesses and they make you go to the Kingdom Hall twice a week and they do family worship and you have to go out in service. Like, okay, I got baptized at 14. I wouldn't say that I was agnostic toward Jehovah's Witnesses before the age of 14, right? I was raised in it. I was raised as a Jehovah's Witness. So this is um, evil fucking gaslighting that's happening here. It's really gross that they do this. Um, okay, let me pull up this video, the actual documentary, which we'll watch a little bit of at least. I don't know how long it is. Gavardi documentary. Um, mm, 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 mm. Yep, yeah, here we go. I don't think we're going to be able to watch the whole thing because this segment is only supposed to be an hour and we're coming up. I think this video is 45 minutes. So I can play it a little bit. And we got to shout out this lovely, physically attractive chatter who says, even if you're not baptized, if you leave the organization, you're shunned just the same as someone who is shunned. They don't see the difference. So this statement is disgusting. Yeah. Good fucking point. It obviously didn't matter whether or not she was baptized because she was shunned anyway. Uh, so that's a great point from my wife. Um, the the perpetually based opinions of my wife. And let me switch my uh, YouTube account so that we don't get ads. All right. Okay. Uploaded by Chad and champion of the people, Lee Barnes. Allow me to present my screen uh not that screen this one and let's do a little bit of 1.5 playback and let's do a little bit of subtitles manipulated into believing it wasn't the best thing to take it to the police i spent the first 15 years of my life as a jehovah's witness now i want to know how this organization was able to control my family <laughs> And to finally get answers Appreciate to the questions you, I've had my whole life. <laughs> Often popes fun at in popular culture, most people think of the Jehovah's Witnesses as those harmless Christians that knock on your door wanting to talk about God. Yes? Damn. It's like she stole the intro to my first video I made on this channel. I'm fucking suing Rebecca Vardy for everything she's got. Hello, we were wondering if we could talk to you about Jesus. <laughs> But what do we really know about them? They operate under a strict hierarchy topped by nine men known as the Governing Body, based at their recently built worldwide headquarters in Warwick, New York, shown in their online videos. They have over 8 million members worldwide, with the UK home to around 130,000. They run a prolific media empire based around their Watchtower magazines and blog. This, I, I, yeah, sorry, we definitely are going to watch this because it's already so good. You know, I really like that these local, so the, the, the Pennsylvania report we just watched, and now this documentary point out how big the religion is. Like documentaries about fucking Nexium, you can have three running documentaries on multiple streaming platforms about Nexium, and they're excellent, of course, and it deserves to be uh, exposed, right? But it's also something that at its peak had maybe a few hundred members, maybe a few thousand. <laughs> Jehovah's Witnesses have eight million members, and they're almost every bit as creepy as Scientology. They Their practices are more or less identical anyway. So I really like that that's the centerpiece of these. Like, this is something you should care about. There's a lot of Jehovah's Witnesses. online videos driven towards increasing their congregation numbers worldwide. When I was young, I remember being shown upsetting pictures of the end of the world in my Bible study books. Uh -huh. And I believed that if I wasn't perfect, I would die at Armageddon. This is so good. The minute you can read, you can read this book. I mean, it's it's available for, for everyone. There's no age limit. This one, I still have nightmares over now. This is called Revelation. BRB. Really scary. 
Nowadays, they use dramatic and forceful videos to warn of an imminent Armageddon when any non-Jehovah's Witnesses will be destroyed. God's kingdom, represented by that stone, will crush all human governments at Armageddon. It's also a religion that's repeatedly faced allegations of child sex abuse, prompted worldwide inquiries into its child protection practices. Victims have begun to speak out about how the organization has handled this. And I'm one of them. How I was a child when the things happened to me and there's so many questions that I have that are not answered. And I think because there were so many restrictions put on us as children, shaped me to becoming quite rebellious as a teenager. Oh, yes. You know, that's some of the things that I'm hoping to kind of get from doing this is, where do the decisions come from? Who makes the decisions? And you know, what authority do these people have? Or do they just make it up as they go along? Some of the rules and regulations of this particular religion are questionable, to say the least. This is, they're going in, they're going all in. I'm returning to Norwich, the city I grew up in, and where many of my family still live as Jehovah's Witnesses. I've not had much contact with my family since I left the religion at the age of 15, and I haven't been back here for almost 10 years. I think it's going to be a bit strange seeing some of the things I remember, but also some of the things that I've tried to form quite a comfortable distance with as well. Oh my God, I used to go down here when I was a child, just going door knocking, always praying that someone from school wasn't going to open the door. And... I always knew I was different growing up. Can anybody in chat um, tell me why Rebecca Vardy is famous, like beyond being a, a footballer's wife? Because one of the articles I read referenced her as being a part of some trial and I had no idea what they were talking about. Um, so far, this is incredibly well done. We didn't celebrate birthdays or Christmas and we were told we wouldn't be allowed a blood transfusion if we got sick. This is so strange. My first stop is my old kingdom hall, the place of worship for my congregation. This was the epicenter of mine and my family's life, where we used to come for services and Bible studies twice a week. Once again, well, great. Remember parking around the corner and then walking through those double doors of toilets. On the left-hand side, I think, there was three different rows of chairs sat out. And I would imagine there'd probably been around 100 and 150 um, members of the organization in that congregation. So these will all be going off on. Right? Their- I've been so ready, man. I'm, I'm so ready for the next time they knock on my door. You know, these, you know, back in my day, we actually went out in the field ministry. This new generation of Jehovah's Witnesses just doing their, doing their Zoom chats and phone calls. Weak. Weak sauce. Uh, service rounds. And uh, this was my parents' life. <laughs> this was my grandparents' life. My granddad was an Sprinting away from the cram- camera crew. <laughs> well-known, well-liked, renowned for, you know, his belief in the faith. Um, it's weird to think Girl, my mom still comes up here. I have not seen her for years either. You would have to do things to keep Jehovah happy because he was always watching. He was always watching who you spoke to, how you spoke. Mm, I love that she's wording it like this because this is such a critical um, part of the culture. You have to make Jehovah happy. You know, what's their flagship children series called? Become Jehovah's friend. You know, God is very much a real person you need to have a personal relationship with in a way that is weird, even for Christians, you know, who talk about having a personal relationship with Jesus, I think. And I think it's going to be a hey, good use of the word panopticon, by the way, from, from Samantha and Chad. That's exactly what it is. Um, yeah, no, this is really, really well done. I really think that a lot of people are going to watch this and have watched it. Uh, this is great. More stuff like this. How you dress how you held yourself, how you conducted every part of your whole life. And we were told if we didn't pray enough, bad things would happen to us. But weirdly enough, as I was stood looking at that sign, I felt guilty. I think the guilt comes from going against everything that I was taught, everything that you're taught not to do, I'm doing, speaking out, questioning, um, bringing the religion's name down. Um, and talking about, I guess, what goes on behind closed doors, because it's a very secretive community. It's a very secretive religion. Not many people know what goes on through those gates. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever, therefore, wants to be a friend of the world is making himself an enemy of God. 
Every month, the most senior members oh, of the oh, oh, Witnesses, known as the governing body, them. upload lengthy sermons to their website to be watched by congregations worldwide. I find some of these videos concerning because they teach that non-believers, also known as worldly people, are enemies of Jehovah and should be avoided. Oh, worldly people. We don't want to have any friendship, whether socially or on social networks, uh, with Jehovah's enemies. You see how fucking clear they are on their own website? The thing that they constantly promote, like, what do they, how do they think they're going to get away with this shit? They post all this stuff to JW.org, which is the thing that they ask everyone to go to. I, I think it's only a matter of time, and I think they should have done it a long time ago, to have an internal website for Jehovah's Witnesses with all of their creepy videos, with JW.org being a purely public-facing website. Um, but they're stupid, so uh, they're not going to do that. So our friends growing up were all members of Jehovah's Witnesses. They were all part of our congregation. And yeah, from very early age, you know, we were made to feel that we were different. We used to get bullied. We used to get picked on, called names, Joho's, Bible bashers, door knockers. <laughs> Joho's. At the same time, <laughs> early like childhood that. was living in a false sense of security. You know, the one place that you didn't feel judged and different was at the Kingdom Halls and going to the meetings because everyone was in, in the same boat, or at least you thought. That's exactly why it works. You you make sure that you are seen as weird by the outside world so that the outside world feels scary and foreign to you. And so the only place you can get any comfort is within the group. That's how these things work. And I, I, I'm standing Rebecca Vardy right now. This She's absolutely crushing it. And it wasn't until things started going wrong within our family unit that that bubble did burst <laughs> and actually the people that you thought Boeing were for Joe. there to protect you and to support you and like your brother and sister were actually not there at all our congregation was a close-knit community led by the most senior members of the church known as the elders as well as leading the services elders would provide spiritual guidance and we were taught to fear and respect them we had to go to them first with all our problems no matter how personal so this was where how I could a jw watching us deny any of this too by the way my mom and my dad were really going for a tough time there's a lot of arguing a lot of you know upset whenever there was a problem the elders would try and intervene you know they'd always be in in the downstairs lounge while us kids were usually in ah, that's the one i wanted um trying to calm situations down and and I think one of my last memories of here was it all kicking off. And then, yeah, and I think we left one night and never came back. <laughs> I was only 11 when my parents split up and my mum moved us out of this house and out of Norwich. I've never understood the reasons, but in the eyes of the Jehovah's Witnesses, my mother had sinned. Mm. We were then shunned by our friends and our family was divided. I've had a difficult relationship with my mum all my adult life, and we've been estranged for the last seven years. So I never asked her what happened between her and my dad, or what role the Jehovah's Witnesses played in the end of their marriage. To understand more about the way that yeah, this is kind of it, it, right? You know, this is uh, all that members can do in watching this stuff and nitpick terminology. And on one hand, that's why I think when we as XGWs watch stuff like this, we're really on the lookout for that because we're like, oh man, witnesses are going to nitpick that term or something. But I think if somebody's really in good faith watching this and in a position where they are willing to change their mind, willing to be reflective, then they'll recognize that they're being unreasonable by nitpicking those things and that the things that she's saying are broadly true and supported by literal video evidence from the publications uh, on Miller, the website. Who was born into the religion but left in 2009 after experiencing a similar devastating family breakdown. I think the public perception of Jehovah's Witness is, is quite character-like, isn't it? But also, they have such a clever disconnect between who they are publicly and who they Allie. are. Publicly, and it's strictly hierarchical. The elders are in charge of the congregation, and you are told as a woman that the husband is the head of the family. He can basically dictate whatever he wants to to the wife. Like many Christians, the Jehovah's Witnesses believe marriage... Allie Miller wrote uh, Last Days, 
uh, which is wonderful. A wonderful memoir, incredibly well written. Uh, great. Love, love that she's a part of this. It's sacred and permanent. But unlike in other religions, divorce is only allowed in the eyes of God in cases of adultery. I was married at 21 and it was a difficult marriage. And then when I was 27, I decided that I wanted to leave the marriage and I had um, what they would class as an affair. And that was when three elders came up to my house with my husband present. It was a very controlling man. And they said that he couldn't leave the room. He had to be there while well, I had to confess in detail to what had happened. And then the elders left and they left me alone with him. But that, that's very similar because my dad and my mum split up. And I remember things like that as well, being interrogated by elders. You know, they were always involved. Whenever my mum and dad had issues, you were never allowed to deal with it outside the Female conversation. Strong. It was always internally dealt with. On the Sunday, one of the elders got up on the platform and they didn't name names, but they basically told the whole of the congregation what I had told them in complete confidence. And it wasn't really very hard for people to guess who it was. I was a vulnerable woman and nobody said, are you okay? They said, we're gonna judge you for that. People just stopped speaking to me. And my mother said that she had to remain loyal to Jehovah and her loyalty to Jehovah meant that she couldn't see me anymore. That's absolutely heartbreaking. The Jehovah's Witness organization <sighs> told us it is false to allege that when congregation elders decide whether an adherent should be expelled, they ask inappropriate questions. Well, they also said they, they do men and women as equals. However, in accordance with the Bible based beliefs and teachings, elders are male. Bullshit. Bullshit. It's helped me understand. I mean, this is kind of the thing that is that I find very interesting about the lascivious questions that you get asked in elders meetings, which I certainly experienced uh, when I got in trouble with a girlfriend. Uh, I kind of asked really, really personal questions that were disgusting, you know, but the reason why they ask these things is because I think culturally it's something that elders inherit from one group of elders to the next you know but also because um and if i had thought more we, I, I was going to Okay, are we back? No. No? This is what it looks like. Okay, are you back? Oh. okay there's a delay. Okay, we're we're good. Okay, sorry about that. Always cool when that happens. 
with 177 people watching. <laughs> That's probably going to pick up. <laughs> no, you're fine. Okay, okay. Sorry about that. Yes. It would appear that somebody was trying to sabotage my microphone. Um. Okay. So sorry about that. I, I think one of the cats <laughs> walked by and, and knocked my microphone plug out. Okay. So let us... Let us resume. Let us resume. All I was saying was to reset. Uh, some people are still saying no sound, but I hear it. I hear it perfectly. Um, so creepy elder questions. It seems to be a part of the culture. Like it just seems to be a thing that has always existed, <laughs> um, uh, you know, as, as far back as you can go. But also it does, I think that the elder's manual, when you look at the way it breaks down, the differences between like pornea and what technically constitutes sexual immorality, it's all super, super specific, like really granular details of like, was there penetration involved? And so I think sometimes they ask these questions because they feel that they have to go through a weird uh, sexual immorality checklist to see if it technically qualifies as a reproval offense or a disfellowshipping offense. So I, I think that that's part of it. Um, but yeah, I don't know where that comes from. Uh, I'm not surprised to hear they deny it um, because there's probably nothing in writing saying that they have to ask those questions. But I mean, everybody who's ever been at a judicial com committee knows that's exactly what happens. The roles in the religion more and actually probably one of the reasons why my mom and dad split up was because my mum had an affair. Um, well, I'm guessing that's what that's what happened because that's the only way in Jehovah's Witness organisation that you can, in their eyes, divorce. But I soon realised that there was something that had happened, something that she'd done that wasn't acceptable, that was frowned upon, and that she must pay the price for. Organisation. Sorry, I'm skipping ahead a little bit. Practices. Can you just tell me, how did you become elders? Who ultimately gives you the so-called privilege? Like everything inside Jehovah's Witnesses, it's all internal. It's kind of an old boys club, really, if you, if you want to put a label yep. on it. Jehovah's Witnesses believe you're appointed by Holy Spirit. So once you're appointed, your authority really can't be challenged because people's, people who are appointed by God, well, you better do what they say. What are the rule books? Who, who creates this? Okay, I'm guessing it's a group of men again. But do yes. you have a, a specific book if you like, like need to have? Yeah, one. I recognize that one. Yeah. Yeah, um, my, so my he's got the book. book. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, well, my granddad was an elder. I always yeah. used to look because this yeah. was what was the sacred book, wasn't yes, it? No one was sacred. allowed to look at it apart yeah. from elder. You'll notice, basically. you'll notice in Watchtower's, you know, weak ass response, they didn't deny this. They didn't deny that there's a secret elder's book. <laughs> I mean, they really can't. It's right there. This is a, an instruction manual. For, for every scenario you might you might come up with, um, how sh how should I respond if somebody's accused of doing something wrong, some kind of sin? I think twice I've I've been on judicial committees that resulted in someone being disfellowshipped. So talk to me about di being disfellowshipped. How do you get to the point where so so you're at, the, shunned? at the point where a judicial committee decides this person is not repentant, an announcement is made to the congregation, this person is no longer one of Jehovah's Witnesses, and every member of the congregation then would be expected to shun that person. You know, that's family members as well. When my two daughters were disfellowshipped and I had to cut them off, you've got to be prepared mentally to completely view them as dead. And if they ring you up, you're supposed to put the phone down. Jehovah's Witnesses is still called a loving arrangement. Jehovah's loving arrangement. There's oh, it's a, there's nothing, nothing loving, loving about that. Mm -hmm. um, and all while they're disfellowshipped, they're still expected to attend meetings. I know from personal experience with my family, it's just a horrendous experience. And all that is in an attempt to make you even more repentant for whatever sin you've caused, yeah. to bring you back into the religion, to be reinstated yeah. as quickly as physically possible because mm. they want to show you what you've lost. And, and I would say, you know, if you, if you want to ask the question, is this a high control religion? I would say that's one of the key questions you should be asking about any organization. How, how do you leave? Mm -hmm. And if there is no gracious way to leave with family and friends relationships intact, then yeah, that's high control. There you go. There to you me, go. This is pretty devastating. Not about. I gotta say, this is this is really rough. Um, 
I will, we won't watch the whole thing because it is quite long and we're out of the news segment, but I let's do check in with Jason Wynn though. I believe that's who that is. To gather an information on the organization. Hi Jason, Hello. nice to meet you. Nice to meet I'm you. Becky. Thanks Very for welcome. having us. So I have what I like to call the cabin. Jason Wynn was disfellowshipped from the Jehovah's Witnesses in 2001 for having sex before marriage. I'm loving the fact that there's four women doing the show. Yeah. It's really kind of That's a kick in the nuts. Horrifying to them, isn't it? He was so concerned about the lack of transparency within the organization that he's collated huge amounts of information from both current and former Jehovah's Witnesses. This is amazing. Did you build this? Yes, and I had to build it so big because I have so many hard drives in there with so much information. Holy relating to shit, this is so cool. This is like some real inside baseball stuff. But, this, you know, I've always wondered how the hell does he, you know, how, how is he maintaining all this information? It's so much, you know, it's thousands and thousands of PDF scans. Uh, there might be, I don't know, there might be millions of documents on the website. Uh, that's amazing. Jason has an archive of private policy documents, legal evidence, and correspondence with the Jehovah's Witnesses. Much of this was used to support the case against them in the independent inquiry into child sex abuse. How do Jehovah's Witnesses, specifically the elders, deal with alleged child abuse in, in their congregation? So in any kind of uh, serious sin, including child abuse, there always has to be either two or more witnesses to the incident, or there has to be um, a confession. So they have a section here in the Shepherd, the Flock of God says, there must be two or three eyewitnesses, not just people repeating hearsay. No action can be taken if there is only one witness. So this is where it gets really complicated. Really, you don't have eyewitnesses to yeah. a crime of child abuse, unless it was a paedophile ring and they're all together, but which of these paedophiles are going to yeah. uh, confess against the others? Highly unlikely, right? So, so it's up to the elders to determine whether mm. they want to throw it out or not. That's incredible. It's so valuable having him here because, you know, he just knows all this stuff and he's able to just, state it perfectly it had to have really annoyed much terror that he was involved with this the jehovah's witness policy on child sex abuse states victims their parents or anyone else who reports such an accusation to the elders are clearly informed by the elders that they have the right to report the matter to the authorities the organization will say that jehovah's witnesses do not prevent anyone from reporting child sexual abuse what they mean by that is that if someone has been abused, they don't stop them from reporting it to the police. They are not talking about elders. So the point there is that it's it's the it's the parents who have the responsibility to report, not the elders. And that's the way they've always operated about every type of activity. They use sophistry to be able to deceive their members, to deceive the courts, to deceive the governments, to deceive everyone really. You know, we have had cases in, in Ireland and in the UK where elders have tried to report child sexual abuse and any one of them that did report child abuse to the authorities, those elders were defrocked or as they call it, deleted and the stripped off their titles. They were deleted in Ireland, they've been deleted in the United Kingdom. And That's what we were just talking about earlier. Not being loyal or lacking soundness of mind. Not being loyal. Oh, I just love that this is reaching a mass audience, you know, because it is so <laughs> deeply creepy. <laughs> And uh, yeah, I, this is going to be really shocking for a lot of people to see, because I think, I, as she stated at the outset, the the reputation is that they're just kind of quirky door knockers. And because there are so many of them, you probably have a family member or a friend of a friend who is a witness, and you probably don't think too much of it. So this is really great. Um, this is really, really great. Wish I had earbuds to hear this instead of hearing this mind-numbing Q&A section. I don't understand. I don't understand what you mean. So we are going to move into the fun half. That, you know, that's, that's all a little heavy. And we will certainly be following future developments of that uh, on the channel. But I want to uh, shout out um, just, you know, kind of unbiased, the greatest commenter of all time, Christina Kreitz. Um, if the organization really wanted to protect its members, that point about reporting to authorities wouldn't be so self-serving. It makes it seem like they're trying to protect everyone, really. They're only protecting themselves. Yeah, like if they really cared, they just wouldn't have these arbitrary policies that clearly put more roadblocks in place to reporting. And 
the issue, of course, with putting it on the parents is what if the parent is one of the abusers? Uh, the, it's just so ridiculous and short-sighted. And the only reason that they wouldn't want to remove these policies is because of pride and fear of legal reprisal. So that's what we're dealing with, folks. And I, I thought we would start the, the fun half by looking at some of the cringy videos that witnesses have been putting out lately. I like reacting to this stuff. But yeah, I mean, how can we not? This wasn't on the agenda, so to speak. But when the front page article is, keep on the watch, artificial intelligence, a blessing or a curse, what does the Bible say? I think we do have to click the button and find out. I mean, if we're going to fuck around with this, we got to find out. There's, I'm willing to bet, and I'm not a scholar. I'm not a biblical expert. I feel reasonably confident that the Bible says nothing about robots and computers and stuff. I just don't, I don't know. I don't know. And I, in fact, I would have had them avoid this topic entirely because it almost absurdly underlines how limited the Bible is as a resource to any kind of modern problem. Like the Bible obviously says literally nothing about this. So what are they trying to say? Okay. They have some fucking quotes from the fucking, from fucking places about AI. The Bible shows why humans cannot guarantee that their technological advances will result in being used only for good. Don't be so proud of this technological terror you've conjured here. Honestly speaking, like a Sith Lord. <laughs> Even when humans have, or people have good intentions, they may not foresee the negative effects of their actions. There is a way that seems right to man, but in the end it leads to death. Wow. So the Bible says that sometimes people think they know what's up, but really they don't. And that's the kind of timeless wisdom you can only get from the Bible. And the other thing that they cite is a person has no control over how others will use or misuse his work. That doesn't have anything to do with AI. It doesn't have anything to do. I must leave my work behind for the man coming after me. And who knows whether he will be wise or foolish, yet he will take control over all the things I spent great effort and wisdom to acquire under the sun. And what Watchtower did is they saw this and said, that's kind of like chat GPT when you think about it. That's what the book of Ecclesiastes was really talking about. Such uncertainty highlights why we need guidance from our creator. Humans are fucking stupid. They don't know how to do anything. And wouldn't it be easier if you just had someone tell you what to do all the time? Like us, for example. Um, ridiculous. And oh, wouldn't you know it? Don't put your faith in computers. Put it in the earth? The earth. I guess you should put your faith in the earth. I don't know. This article is uh, preposterous. But I, I just had to shout that out. Now, I wanted to... Um, we're getting into the fun half, although this is, I guess, not necessarily the most fun video ever. Uh, I wanted to look at this video, this old, this morning worship from our good buddy and pillow ejaculation enthusiast, Gary Bro. Um, that's his official title. I'm just reading it off the website. And JDB.org is very slow lately, I've noticed. Oh, boy. Our boy, not looking great. We might have to look at this. I might have to look at that. But I want to look at this uh, Gary Bro video because uh, it's really, really weird. I had part of a script written as a rebuttal to it. And it is entitled Deep Breath. <gasps> Gary Bro, the older men and the superior authority standing in their proper place. Romans 13, 1 through 4. And this is sort of a it's an internal bit of PR for witnesses who are concerned about all of these things they're seeing in the media. Um, it, it's one of these things that is going to be completely incomprehensible to anybody outside of the group, as I think you'll see. And I do just want to shout out Ryan Cultastic, one of the greats, one of the best in the biz right now. 
and uh <laughs> it might be ai slowing down the website i mean you could legitimately write watch our articles using ai they sound inhuman and robotic anyway uh and uh i know that um my little pimo i don't know if he's posted him on reddit or not but he sent me a few things where <laughs> he did a like a chat gpt prompt and had a pretty spot on watch our articles fat back out um we have many we have many best in business. We have skeptic and scoundrels in here too. We had self-aware NPC earlier. We've got we've got many creators of content. But let's look at this ghoulish fucking palpatine hooked up to a big robot arm looking motherfucker. Gary Bro. You know, some secular authorities have drawn wrong conclusions about the involvement of the Congregation of Jehovah's Witnesses when an individual commits a serious wrong that violates both civil law and scriptural law. That was one sentence. That was one sentence that was so confusing. But first, well, I have to introduce a special guest who's also in her PJs. Please do welcome commentator spectacular Christina, a.k.a. Yolanda, my wife. <laughs> What's up, baby? Hey. Christina, have been signing off in the chat. Uh, I have, yeah. Yeah. How you doing? Sorry, I have, like, bed head. Same oh. here. Same here. The whole time I've just been like, oh, God. <laughs> what was I thinking? Oh, just hanging out. <laughs> oh, just hanging out. <laughs> we quote SpongeBob a lot in this house. Uh, please do, if you haven't already, watch our rebuttal. Uh, oh, yes, please do. It was a lot of fun to make. And I hope you guys enjoy it. And, you know, we got some feedback that I actually wasn't... I meant to read this earlier. Let's see if I still have the screenshot on my phone. But we there was a post on the XJW Reddit that your friend told us about. Uh -huh. uh, the post was, Man, Alt Worldly's video on the new drama with his wife is hilarious, which is very nice. <laughs> Top voted comment. He's getting better. Less rambling. <laughs> Honestly, though, he is getting better. And it's because of me. So you're welcome for that. Now, my other favorite comment was, I like his foul-mouthed wife. She's funny. Thank you, guys. That's <laughs> very nice of you. How do you like being referred to as my foul-mouthed wife? I appreciate it's that. It's true. I think it's a great compliment. It's funny. I Oh my god. I swear. I <laughs> swear to God. And I can't even blame the no. cat. Although, can you pick up our, our other special guest? Pick him up? Yeah. Yeah, let's show him off because he's being really cute. Well, doing this means that he's not going to be cute. He's anymore. not going to be cute anymore, but here's Bo. Bo's enjoying his last few days being the baby in this yes, house. Yes, that's right. Yeah, he doesn't know it, but we're getting a, a puppy. <laughs> Yes, we are getting a puppy, guys. Yeah, so next time we stream, we'll have a very rambunctious tiny potato tiny, to show off. Tiny potato. I know, right? We didn't. We don't. I don't have a sound overseer yet. <laughs> I don't have a sound overseer. It's not me, I swear. This really does have Zoom meeting vibes, though. I have to say. <laughs> um, what kind of pub? Just a, a wee chihuahua beeb. I don't think that pictures on my. Uh, on my iCloud will load. Can I try and show them? <laughs> yeah, you want to try and hold it up to the camera? Yeah. Yeah, sure. We are in the fun half. This is pure anarchy and chaos. I might be able to snip out the technical difficulty segments. Let's Where's see. the camera? There we yeah, go. Yeah, right there. Oh, you can't really see it, but kind of. you can kind of see. You get the vague outline of a <laughs> baby <laughs> chihuahua. <laughs> Just a little uh, potato. A little potato. Our friends... Uh, Heather, who was on the uh, memorial stream, mm -hmm. uh, her, and her, her and her husband had puppies. They gave birth to puppies. <laughs> there has to be a better way of saying that. <laughs> Their dogs had more dogs, and we're getting a, one of them. But All don't right. tell our apartment people. <laughs> 
people. <laughs> yeah, please don't don't sabotage the baby puppy coming to our house. Yeah. That would be very mean. Thanks for stopping by. Anytime. The plan was to have you just do the commentary with me, but you kind of have a bit of a headache this morning. And afternoon. And all, afternoon. All day. Good evening actually. and good night. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Maybe next time, kids. <laughs> next time, kids. All right, babe. Well, okay, thank you for bye. stopping by. I'm going to get to Gary Bro. And we're going to repeat this sentence because it was very confusing. Um, now, pay attention to, to old Gary's wording here because this is a fucking mouthful. Yeah, Pimo. I think that's safe to say. You know, some secular authorities have drawn wrong conclusions about the involvement of the Congregation of Jehovah's Witnesses when an individual commits a serious wrong. Some authorities are concerned about the involvement when certain individuals... That violates both civil law and scriptural law. Uh, part of the misunderstanding involves our use of the term judicial committee. Now, some erroneously conclude that the congregation is trying to take over the work of the police or the judicial courts, and that's simply not the case. Yeah, okay, so this is a, a straw man. This is what we call a straw man argument, and this is really, really absurd. Like, think about their wording here. Like, what they're putting forth is that some people are confused. They're a little confused. And part of the confusion is the word judicial committee. So apparently there are people who are investigating Jehovah's Witnesses, anonymous authorities of some kind, who are curious enough to investigate Jehovah's Witnesses and the wrongdoing, but are not curious enough to look up the definition of the word judicial committee. So they just somehow hear this term. I don't know how they hear this term, but they just hear it. And then they assume that they know what it means. And this apparently is the, <laughs> this is the confusion that he's clearing up in this talk. Isn't this like so fucking convoluted? He's, he's taken such a walk. He's taken a leisurely jaunt to any kind of cogent point. But the reason why he's doing this is to make it seem as if reports that they are, that witnesses are seeing in the media are absurd and based on misunderstandings. So he paints it in the most vague, confusing way possible. So that a witness is, they're taking away, oh, okay, they're just confused about judicial committees. I understand that. That would be hard to explain to an outsider. I think that's what he's going for here. We're not going to go through this entire talk because it is mostly nonsense about him talking about, you know, like secular authorities and the Bible and the Israelite time. It's completely it's a straw man argument, so he's arguing against nothing, so it's of absolutely no interest to us. But this whole video is just an interesting illustration of how far they have to go to dilute and distort <laughs> arguments made against them. As explained in the May 2019 Watchtower, page 7, that our <laughs> comments are taken from here today. So let's briefly yeah, review so not based the, history the Bible of handling judicial matters amongst God's people. I'd like to do so under this theme. Older men and superior authorities standing in their proper place. <laughs> nice smile. Good smile. I mean, he really looks like zombie Palpatine, doesn't he? If you put a hood on this guy, you get a couple mummies putting in like test tubes. He's he's not looking great. Um so yeah, this is what this is the talk that he gives is a weird Bible according to JW's history of secular authorities and older men appointed by Jehovah. But the entire thing that he's underlining is this statement that we we saw in the first part of today's stream where they Watchtower when they put out statements say the judicial process is not a replacement for the secular authorities. We're not we're not saying that. Stop saying that we're saying that. But nobody's saying that. People are just saying that culturally people trust the elders more than the secular authorities, which of course we know is true because they are told to trust the congregation more than they trust the secular authorities. So 
he's making a complete non-argument against absolutely nothing. But I wanted to show that off because it felt apropos to the, the kinds of videos that we were watching earlier. Um, what I really want to get into is this kind of... I, I've seen some screens from this. Uh, I've seen some screens going around from uh, David Splane's latest morning worship. And so I think we should we should watch it. David Splane is my least favorite governing body member. He is, so he's my favorite guy to get mad at. Did that make sense? Um, so all scripture is inspired. So probably a bunch of new light, right? You never heard this kind of talk before, but well, not so fast. He has some new takes. All scripture is inspired of God. Wow. Now, mm. let's wow. stop right there. Let's stop. Let's and stop. unpack that statement. Pump the because there's a lot to unpack. Uh, let's take the last part first. Inspired of God. Now, you know what that means. It means that God put his thoughts into the mind of man, and then men wrote them down. So every time you see stuff in the Bible about women being worse and weaker and being stoned to death and raped, you know, that is what God wanted in the Bible because he put his thoughts into guys' brains. Or is it? I don't know. He might say something crazy. You know what that means. But now, when you tell a householder from house to house that the Bible is inspired by God, does the householder necessarily know what you mean? Not necessarily. Exactly. Why not? Because the word inspired is thrown around rather casually today. This yeah, sure. motion picture was inspired by real events. God is not in the picture. Hey, I made that joke a in a video once. For a songwriter is inspired by a sunset. And so if the householder <laughs> doesn't have a strong okay. Bible background, it's not likely that he understands what you mean when you say that the Bible is inspired by God. And you'll have to explain that the Bible is God's thoughts about men and not man's thoughts about God. But now we're going to spend most of our time on the first part of our text. All, all scripture. Oh. And we have to ask, how did Paul and the other Bible writers and the early Christians in the first century... How did they determine which writings were inspired and which were not? Now, we'll examine three Bible texts that illustrate the problem. Uh, let's turn to Luke oh, chapter no. 1. no. Problems with the Bible. And verse 1. Sounds like one of my videos. A moment. And uh, our goal in You're reading okay. this text is to see, um, is there a problem with determining whether a writing is inspired or not? Luke chapter 1, verse 1. And Luke writes, Seeing that many have undertaken to compile an account of the facts that are given full credence among us. What is Luke saying? There were many Gospels of Jesus Christ in the first century, and yet only four of them were accepted as inspired. So this is kind of interesting because generally speaking, Watchtower does not talk about like canonicity of the Bible in ways that some more like, I, I guess you could say progressive, but at least more transparent churches will talk about, you know, like these are conversations that have existed <laughs> since the early centuries, obviously. And I, everything he's talking about is probably common knowledge to most people who consider themselves students of the Bible. But despite thinking of themselves as Bible scholars, witnesses actually know very, very little about the Bible and how it was written and textual criticism. So it is a little surprising to hear David Splane talk about things that I'm assuming he's going to talk about, which are what they would consider apocryphal books of the Bible. So things like the Gospel of James, and the Gospel of Peter, stuff like that. Now, how was that determined? Did the Christians put a bunch of manuscripts on the table and, uh, oh, I like this one, or this one not ah. so much? That wouldn't be a very good way to determine which books were canonical, canonical or not. But it was how it worked. Now, as a second uh, illustration or example, Paul's first letter to the Corinthians 
was not Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. If you turn to 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 9, you'll Whoa. see what I mean. Now I'm getting incepted by David's plane. First Corinthians 5 and verse 9. And here Paul writes in his first letter to the Corinthians, In my letter I wrote you to stop keeping company with sexually immoral people. So there was a previous letter before what we now call Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. I guess if you want to be picky, you would call this one Paul's first inspired letter to the Corinthians. But now that previous letter was never accepted as part of the Bible canon. Yeah, maybe because there's no copies of it. Maybe the Bible canon is limited by what actually existed and was recirculated. <laughs> Jesus fucking Christ. This is going to be really hard to listen to because David's plain. I, I, he seems to me to be, I guess, maybe along with Mark Sanderson, although I wonder. Splain definitely fancies himself uh, a scholar, a pseudo scholar, you might say, because he has absolutely zero credentials in anything at all, let alone, you know, ancient texts and the Bible shit. Um, oh, boy, it was meant to be. See, the angels are trying to tell you something, Kim. They're trying to say, stop listening to that stream and stop at this card. <laughs> um, but no, don't do that. And also like and subscribe and leave a comment on the comment feed. Okay, so th this is this is going to be tough because actual bible scholarship would demonstrate a, probably a very different thing than whatever he's about to say because if you actually get into the bible canon and the way it all came together, you have to acknowledge for example that the gospels that we have were not listen were not written until long after Jesus was dead with the book of John maybe not even being written into the early 2nd century late 1st century or early 1st century and John expresses a very different uh christology for Jesus uh that and so what he's talking about you know is acknowledging what actual like historians and Bible scholars would probably see as, you know, the limitations of the fact that Paul's writings, only some of them seem to get passed around and were considered to be scripture. And so what was determined to be scripture was very much based on what he said it wasn't based on. It was based on opinion. I like this versus I don't like this. Uh, and you see this in Paul's writings. He's always talking about other people who are writing other letters that he doesn't like or agree with. So there were a lot of different things. And what ended up in the Bible is not a result of inspiration. What we now have as the Bible canon was really not finalized until the fourth century with the, you know, Council of what, Nicaea or something. Um, so we'll see how he paints it. <laughs> I just, these are hard to watch because he really thinks he's smart and he's really, really dumb. Why not? Was it a good letter? No <laughs> doubt it was. Was it accurate? Why does he have no doubt way? that it was? Maybe. Maybe. Maybe not. He's not willing to go that far. It wasn't inspired. Now, why do we say maybe Proof? not? Proof? Well, Insight Source? made a very interesting comment about the writings of Bible writers when they were not writing under inspiration. And speaking of these writings... Insight says that they may have reflected to some degree the incomplete understanding that existed in the early years of the Christian congregation. What did he just reference? They understood that they may under inspiration. And speaking of these writings, Insight says that they Insights. may have reflected ah, to some degree the, the incomplete that understanding wrote. that existed in the early years of the Christian congregation. So if someone was just writing for himself, writing a letter to some congregation or some brother, uh, maybe the disciple James, uh, he's writing to someone early on before the decision of circumcision is made. And uh, he says, well, it's probably best for Gentile Christians to be circumcised. He might have said something like that. 
But then, of course, when the decision was made, under the influence of Holy Spirit, James would have written and spoken in harmony with Holy Spirit. And if- <laughs> this is just made up. This is literally just made up. He's just making up fan fiction about how the <laughs> how the Bible canon came together. But the reason why he's able to do this is because Jehovah's Witnesses are quite certain that they are mirroring first century worship. And that they don't just have a similar structure, but that they are of a of the same mind, that structurally and culturally they they were very similar, which is why you often they, they just now talk about the first century governing body, despite that not being a term that existed until probably the 19th century, right? Um, and so he feels confident that he can just speculate about what it was like. Because he's like, well, it's probably like it is for modern day Jehovah's Witnesses. We're all Jehovah's people. I'm basically a modern day apostle because I'm the leader of God's people now. I mean, not leader. I'm taking the lead. It's different. So he just feels a profound connection to these first century brothers and feels he can speculate on their behalf. Of course, his letter, the letter of James, was written under inspiration. So when Bible writers were inspired, their letters and their writings were without error. Now, one last example. Turn to Colossians 4 and verse 16. Just imagine I'm doing a long, awkward zoom in as it takes him 20 minutes to find the scripture. The kind of thing I would do in post if there was going to be any post on this. And Paul writes... And when this letter Watch this. has Watch been this read among you, he does before he starts reading. And Paul, this is the kind of thing I love. And Paul writes, <laughs> and when this letter has been read among you, arrange for it also to be read in the congregation of the Laodiceans, and for you also to read the one from Laodicea. It really is like this. So, you know, if the Bible did so, say something, it might go a little something like this. He just is pretty sure what the Bible would have said if it could have. The letter to the Colossians, inspired. The letter to the Laodiceans, not inspired. Making it up, making well, things up. how was the decision made? Now, the Catholic Church claims that the so-called fathers of the church made the decision that they are the ones who compiled the Bible canon at the Council of Carthage in 397 CE. But the decision was made much, much earlier than that. Based on and we have a clue. zero evidence. Oh, we have a clue. <laughs> Detective Splain coming out, cracking open his, his you know, two-brimmed hat, his double-brimmed hat and his magnifying glass here. Yeah, it's not just the Catholic Church that says this. It's literally everybody who knows about history. It's not just the Catholic Church. Now, I think the point he's trying to make is that there did seem to be a consensus of sorts as to what books were considered canon, because as Christianity is growing, there are writings that are considered at least to be more widely agreed upon as scripture, right? Some of Paul's letters, which were in their original incarnation, just letters, would be passed around and retranscribed, and that would become canonical in some sense. But what he doesn't want you to think is that there were different sects of Christianity, and Gnostic Christians had completely different Gospels that had a completely different theology and Christology and all that. And he doesn't want people to think about that, that the reason why Jehovah's Witnesses have this Bible canon is because of false religion, because, of course, they don't believe that true Christianity existed between century two and century 18, right? They don't believe that th there were a few scattered lone gunmen here and there who, by sheer force of will, did some kind of stepping stone butterfly effect that would eventually lead to Jehovah's Witnesses. But for the most part, this was a time of spiritual darkness. So he needs it to be the case that the Bible canon was actually formed in the first century, despite books like Revelation likely not being even written until the second century. When we read Peter's words at 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 16. We often read this verse uh, for another reason, but let's read 2 Peter 3, 16 and think about the Bible canon. 
And here uh, Peter is talking about Paul, and he says, speaking about these things as he does in all his letters. Now Peter here is writing in the year 64, and that means that at least 13 of Paul's 14 letters had already been circulated. So he talks about Paul writing in all his letters. However, some things in them are hard to understand. And these things, the ignorant and unstable, are twisting as they do also the rest of the scriptures. So here, already in the year 64, a decision had been made. The year 64. Now, I just am kind of curious in checking his math here because I so I, I grabbed my Oxford study Bible, annotated Oxford study Bible here. And it's got notes about such things. So let's look at Second Peter and see when it was written and see if it was 64. And I'm not even saying he's wrong. I just find that their timeline is often, you know, wrong. Why can't I find Peter? Is it because I haven't read the Bible in like two years, let alone opened a physical Bible? Peter, where are you, buddy? Okay. Second Peter. The earliest list of... <laughs> well, one thing... Okay. Second Peter may have been written around 125 CE. <laughs> so he's a little off. He's a little off by a few decades. And of course, he's probably not going to mention the fact that most New Testament scholars do not think Peter is the actual author of 2 Peter. A possible explanation for the composition of the letter by someone other than Peter is that 2 Peter is a testament in letter form. In a testament, a leader says farewell to his followers and gives them ethical advice and or revelations about the future to guide the followers after the leader's death, such testaments are usually composed in the leader's name by somebody else. But of course, they don't want people to know <laughs> that they have absolutely uh, no basis for any of their, like, all of their chronology is based on, you know, biblical literalist traditions and also based on their own internal made-up timeline that only deals with Jehovah's Witnesses, which is based around, you know, 607. So he's just uh, wrong in <laughs> making things up. Uh, can I do a, does someone say a Maleficent voice or a Malenfant voice? Chat's moving so fast, I can't even keep up, bro. I don't know. He He kind of just has a generic voice like this. Right. I guess that's kind of like Malinfant. We'll watch that and see how close it is. All right, back to the disaster. Paul's letters were part of the scriptures. How? Well, we haven't answered the question. We keep asking the question, but we haven't answered it. The answer I can't really is found in First Corinthians chapter twelve. The only thing about him is that he kind of has an Orson Welles quality about him. He's got a little bit of that sort of quality to his voice, but I, I can't, I can't really do it. <laughs> and verse 10. You know, they have editors. They could edit out the I remember our, our point in reading this. We're looking for the way in which Christians were able to determine in the Thanks. first century <laughs> which Bible books and letters were inspired and which were not. So Paul is talking about the gifts of the Spirit here, and he says that there was given to yet another operations of powerful works, to another prophesying, to another discernment of inspired expressions. Certain Christians in the first century had a miraculous gift of the Spirit that allowed them to determine, to discern, 
Which writings were inspired and which were not? <laughs> now, wait a minute. Now, wait a minute. What? So God would inspire stuff. But he also had to have like notaries, like spiritual notary publics who could verify the veracity of other people's spiritual shit. Like, but this process is still entirely invisible, by the way. You know, so anybody can claim that they wrote something under inspiration and anybody can claim that somebody else wrote something under inspiration, which is, of course, the history of the Bible canon is people saying, eh, I'm pretty sure this one's inspired by God. So I don't, <laughs> I don't know how you can make such claims, but he's making them. And that is how the Bible canon came together. And and when you think of it, it really makes sense, doesn't it? No, it makes no sense. Holy Spirit guided the writing of the Bible and Holy Spirit guided the collection of the inspired writings together into Via what the we Catholic now Church. know as all scripture. All scripture is inspired of God. Okay. Great. That was great. Thank you for that pseudo intellectual wank fest. <laughs> How embarrassing. Do you think he feels bad about himself for what a bad job he did? Um, is this morning worship that we're talking about, by the way, is it? I noticed this. He had orange lips in the video go back and check um and when you think of it it just really makes sense doesn't it i really like that between catholic and jb bibles well some of the I don't, I don't know if it's the catholic bible but some of the catholic bibles have some like apocryphal books in them so i don't know there are a few extra you might get some maccabees in there you know um is this the william Mollenfont talk that's been going around Let's see, because he talks about evolution, and apparently it's very cringe. And this is, uh, okay, thank you, Eric, for bringing this up, because this is something that I was going to bring up, and then I got sidetracked by my own bullshit. But I, I, I find that these gifts of the Spirit are, are a big problem for Jehovah's Witnesses and what they try to claim, that you know they're this reinstitution of the first century church, because in these books that they consider to be inspired of God, like it very clearly says that there will be gifts of the spirit. Like the outpouring of the Holy spirit was demarcated by people being able to like speak in tongues and perform miracle healings and stuff. So why can't any of the governing body do that? Why can't modern day witnesses do that? Don't they don't spirit appointed men have those same abilities and why don't they? Uh, so I don't know. It sure would be convenient if they were able to perform miracles, then it would be harder to deny their claims. But for some reason, God arbitrarily decided that and they, don't, they don't do that anymore. I, that was kind of a first century thing. I don't want to wear out my tricks. I'm trying this new thing where I don't do anything. And you kind of just have to trust that I'm going to do something at some point. Our theme is a very interesting one about the spiritual man. How he, <laughs> he does say so himself, things. the theme is interesting. It's the spirit of God that makes a Christian into a person who stands out as different from those who are part of this world. William Malinfox. So with that in mind, read with me 1 Corinthians this deep voice chapter motherfucker. 2, verse 12. All right. The spirit that we receive from Jehovah God is his active force. And we really must have it if we're going to understand spiritual things, if we're going to appreciate the things that Jehovah God has. Now, with a definition this vague, you can always question whether or not you have the Holy Spirit at all, because what does active force mean? In some kind of invisible power that does something, I guess. That's kind of all it fucking means. So it's like, you can always have that self-doubt of, oh, no, I don't have the Holy Spirit because this bad thing happened. That must mean I need to go out and service more and be at more meetings and watch talks by William Malinfant. A very interesting discussion, if I do say so myself. It's kindly given us, as the text states. Has Jehovah's Spirit opened the door to kindly give you and give me wonderful things? No. The kingdom, the ransom, fake, fake. the hope of everlasting life, fake, not real. a new world, 
the resurrection. These are things that the spirit has revealed. That's just what my commentary turns people. into now. Just anytime they talk, I was like, that's not real. That's not real. God's not real. So, no, you're wrong. Well, something else that we've received is the worldwide brotherhood, or really that we're a part of. I thought you were going to say web. And the when world? you examine the Why? worldwide brotherhood, yeah. it becomes very evident. It could never exist apart from Jehovah God's spirit. This is so, you know, this is kind of the main thing that witnesses will go back to is like, but the brotherhood, the organization, this could only exist with Holy Spirit. Like, well, how could, how would you know that? How do you know that? You don't think that other religions say the exact same thing about their religion? Only the Catholic Church. I mean, the Catholic Church has much, much longer, more storied history. Uh, so I don't know. I don't really understand what is supposedly so miraculous about it other than that it is very unified or else and we know why it's unified because you get kicked out if you fuck up no way could man bring about such a brotherhood now let's read verse 13 first corinthians 2 verse 13. 13 it says these things that is the things he has given us we also speak not with words taught by human wisdom but with those taught by the spirit, as we explain spiritual matters with spiritual words. This is such an important part of how the governing body maintains control is that they truly do not, they don't present themselves as the leaders, even though of course they are. Uh, they, re they by, by saying that, what I mean is they will, constantly insist that they are not leaders they are not the leaders they are not special they are imperfect and our organization does not teach human wisdom it only teaches the wisdom of god well, convenient it's a convenient thing to say um it seems to me though that we only ever hear the humans and god is remarkably silent so really what you have is a bunch of people saying trust us god is saying this not just us um so witnesses don't feel that they have an interpretation of the Bible at all. They think that they are reading the Bible the only way it possibly could be read. And that's why he's able to say ridiculous things like this. We focus on spiritual things. The sum total of human experience and wisdom, its writings, philosophies, and teachings are, as Jesus said, of no use at all to gain everlasting life. Fuck this That's guy. That's John 6, 63. Fuck this. Because it can't give you everlasting life. Yeah, why ever bother enjoying anything? You can't, every piece of music that's ever been written, every piece of art that's ever moved you to tears, every incredible invention and medication that's been invented to make people's lives better, it's all nothing. It's garbage. It sucks. It's worthless because it's not me and my religion. And what I'm saying, spiritual matters and spiritual words are found right here in God's word, the Bible. We and our vocabulary is different from the words or the world's way of speaking, which is becoming more and more vulgar and disgusting. Oh. Our like speech centers on spiritual matters. Witnesses, by the way, do absolutely cry. I curse as a witness. I just didn't do it at the fucking kingdom hall. Not to curse. But, you know, what he's really kind of accidentally saying is, yeah, their language is very different from the world. And that they have a group speak. As multiple people have noted, there is a way of speaking for these people who give talks. They all kind of sound the same. They have the same kind of intonation, the same kind of expressions. People in the organization talk differently because there is a group speak that you have to assimilate in order to be accepted as a member of the group. So yes, they do have differences, but it's not that they don't curse. I think we've all heard witnesses, some witnesses curse sometimes. Jehovah's will. And so we explain the spiritual matters that we understand from the scriptures with spiritual words. And in the end, we give glory to Jehovah by doing so. And now let's read verse four. Well, 
I, sorry, there's an interesting comment in chat. I've come to the conclusion that these elderly men may not even be compiling these talks. I believe that they have men behind them writing their material for them. I mean, I, I guess so. But it, it, to me, like, all they're ever saying is the established doctrine of Jehovah's Witnesses. And so, yeah, like, it's not like they're ever really saying anything that's only of their own volition. You know, maybe David Splane gets to go off on his own personal tangents, but I don't know. The, everything they're saying is just literally from the watchtower. The like Gary Bro started his talk that way. My comments are based on this article. Like, that's all they're doing. They do what every lazy brother does when he has a talk is he looks up a watchtower article and nabs some points from it and regurgitates it. So I think you're probably right, especially as they get older. They probably have people on the writing committee prepare little outlines, but it's all kind of, I don't know. It's all so samey that I don't really see any, uh, what, what the benefit would be of having a different layer. If anything, they should have Chad GPT right there talking, saving some fucking time. Christina says group speak is definitely a social construct within a community or culture. JWs are no different. Their community has a set of societal constructs on how to speak and communicate. Yeah, it's true. And it like, it's true of any niche community. You might even have like, you know, with your friend group, you might have like little in jokes and like ways of talking with a specific group of friends that you don't have with other people or whatever, like G uh, Gen Z has slang that my generation didn't, it's not necessarily a bad thing, but in a community like this, which is increasingly isolated uh, and ostracized from mainstream society, it becomes very apparent because they don't talk like anybody. <laughs> they just talk like the group. Oh, good. Somebody's starting to mow the lawn out there. That won't come through. 14. There it says, but a physical man does not accept the things of the spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot get to know them mm. because I they... Somebody who doesn't accept Jehovah's Witnesses is a fool and an idiot and stupid. Speaks of a physical man. It's not speaking about a person with a fleshly body, because after all, all Christians living today on this earth, we have fleshly bodies. But it refers to a person who has no spiritual side to his life. And there are many That's who fall into way. this category. Some of them are humanists. Who uh, seem to me. be people who really want to do what is good. Thanks. They want to help people. Their main pursu pursuit is the welfare of people. Oh, no. But does that make them spiritual? Who gives a shit? You know, that explain that that assumes that being spiritual is better than being secular or humanist, which, of course, it isn't. The only reason he thinks this is because he needs to think it. Otherwise, his entire life has been a huge fucking lie and a waste of time. Um, no, get out of here. <laughs> really? Witnesses just knocked on your door. Did they say anything fun? Um, now, let's also keep in mind that William Malenfant is the same guy who gave a talk railing against social justice and civil rights. He gave that talk that drove me fucking insane. It made me so mad that like I filmed a video after I'd just gotten out of the hospital after my surgery because I was like, oh, oh, I'm so upset. That's that's my voice. That's how, that's my impression of myself. Um, and uh, it, it it's the same kind of thing. And this is how I think you do see their personalities come out a little bit. Like this is clearly this guy's bugaboo is social justice and civil rights and humanists all these people trying to make the world a better place this annoys the shit out of william malinfon he's like these they need to stop wasting their damn time and just become jehovah's witnesses uh so that's kind of his thing in the same way that i think david splain's thing is like being a smart researchy bible guy and gary bro's thing is kind of talking about what people are saying about Jehovah's Witnesses and why they're wrong. And he's the one who gave that talk on why the two witness rule is based and good. Um, so, yeah, I like that he's got a thing. What is good? They want to help people. Their main pursu pursuit is the welfare <laughs> of people. But does that make them spiritual? Mm. No. The spiritual man knows that to love his neighbor as himself Gosh, I'm gonna set that aside. is the second commandment. That's the only thing they follow. But the main thing, the first command. He, you know, this, I find these arguments so fucking annoying because he's like, 
Um, these idiots forgot this commandment from the Bible. <laughs> it's right there in the Bible. And it's like, yeah, 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 yeah. A lot of people think the Bible is bullshit. And, you know, his entire basis of like, these people think they're doing this, but they forgot the second commandment to do it. Like, no, dude, no. <laughs> like, I consider myself a humanist. And it's not that I'm like, oh, shit, I forgot about that part of the Bible. No, I, I just don't believe in the Bible as the inspired word of God. I don't believe it's worth following. So it's really annoying, you know, that he thinks he's doing a real gotcha by being like, um, didn't you forget somebody? It, like the, didn't you forget someone meme? And it's like, you know, you, oh, you forgot about Jesus. Well, great. William Allen Vaughn, you're, you're right. People forgot that they, they're not taking into account the specific doctrine of Watchtower, Bible and Tract.org slash JW Enterprises.gov. And that the most important one is to love Jehovah God with your whole heart, mind, soul, and strength. Very important. And this is something that the humanist does not follow. That's true. What about atheists? agnostics same and evolutionists potentially the same this is annoying because you know he said humanist as a is, if it is separate but atheism is a single stance on a single issue as is evolution by the way so it's really not that like on one hand you got these humanists on the other hand you got all these people that believe in evolution like no these things typically go in hand and they go hand in hand as we studied recently, many people embrace evolution not because they have really studied things and they're convinced by certain things they consider to be facts. No, they've been told by someone that it's true, and so they accept what they've been told. Uh -huh. And on the other hand, there are dyed-in-the-wool atheists and evolutionists who embrace theories that if those theories they embrace were applied to any other discipline or aspect of life, they would not be considered anything but fantasy and wild imagination. This man believes that a guy for real parted the Red Sea with the fucking stick and that that same stick earlier turned into a snake that ate a couple other snakes. That's this guy who doesn't believe in fanciful, silly stories and only believes in facts and logic. This is fucking crazy. Now... I'm not going to deny that there are people who just believe in evolution because they're like, whatever, you know, they haven't done a fucking deep dive on it because you don't fucking need to be an expert in everything. <laughs> like, yeah, most people who aren't uber religious, when they learn about evolution, they're like, OK, that makes sense. And they might not know all the ins and outs of it, but they don't necessarily need to, you know. But if you're a Jehovah's Witness, you need to be intimately familiar with all of these bad faith and outdated debunked uh, apologetic arguments against evolution because you, they want people to think that they, he wants the members to think that everybody in the world is just as ignorant as Jehovah's Witnesses. Everybody's just following somebody. So you might as well just follow us. It's not that people are doing research and coming to their own conclusions. It's not that people are complicated. This is something that, you know, upsets me about, when people get really didactic about demographics and stuff like no, like people aren't monoliths. People are very complicated and they have complex views on things. There are plenty of, you know, th there were atheists uh, who loved Donald Trump, uh, but he, he also appealed to a lot of evangelical Christians. Uh, so, you know, people's political ideology doesn't necessarily have anything to do with what their religious beliefs are. And that goes for everything. You know, there are atheists who really aren't humanists, who are <laughs> selfish assholes. Uh, everybody can suck. Uh, everybody can be ignorant of something. But he wants you to believe that nobody has a strongly informed and well-founded opinion on anything. Everybody has been tricked. Uh, but not you. Not you. Our website only tells the truth. And that's the truth. Oh, see, he just said it. Some physical men. Rid Why is he? What was this point that he's trying to make that they believe in theories that if they were applied elsewhere, they wouldn't make any sense? Like, what is he even saying? Like the like, I, I wouldn't call atheism a theory, but he's he talked about atheists, atheists and agnostics. 
what is that theory? <laughs> it's not a theory. It is a lack of belief or a lack of conviction of belief in a certain thing. That's not even a theory. And by the way, yes, we do have 200 people watching. So you think about this. You know, think about this. Just brainstorm with me for a second. If 200 people commented on this video, everybody watched this, left a little comment and said like, hey, I'm leaving a little comment for my buddy. Uh, then people, it might hit the algorithm. People might watch it. And I would edit, and I'll edit out the parts where there's technical difficulties. I promise. Um, yeah, it really is source. Trust me, bro. Like he's not even establishing what he's talking about. He's like, some of these atheists believe in crazy stuff. That's fanciful. Anyway, moving on. I'm not going to describe what those are. For aspect of life, they would not be considered anything but <laughs> fantasy oh, and wild imagination, and that's the truth. I guess so. I don't know what you're Some physical about. men ridicule believers in God and say, well, your belief in God is just a crutch. I don't need a crutch. Who has ever said this? Well, you do need a crutch. That's the truth of the matter. You're mortal. All of us are mortal. What and is we... he arguing against? Some thing he heard some random guy say in the ministry one time or something? Like, can he at least address? You know, there's some fucking low energy, low effort christian apologia on youtube but you know what they'll do they'll show a little clip of fucking cosmic skeptic or whoever and then they'll talk about why that person's wrong and they'll probably completely mischaracterize the argument or whatever but they'll at least make an attempt to appear like they're being good faith and he doesn't even do that he's like some people say that god's a crutch well we all need crutches dan from the coffee shop the other day said that to me <laughs> who are you arguing against need help in the sense that we need divine intervention, help from Jehovah God, and he provides it through the ransom sacrifice of Jesus Christ. This is an incoherent argument. Let's really think about it. So we it. understand why the physical man acts the way he does. He shuts his eyes to the old need help in the sense. Now I want to hear this crutch argument. Well, you do need a combination, and that's the truth. A crutch. Some physical men ridicule believers in God and say, well, your belief in God is just a crutch. I don't need a crutch. Okay. The point. This is the argument on the table. Some physical men say the belief in God is a crutch. For what? We don't know. It doesn't matter. His rebuttal to that is no. God is not a crutch because... Well, you do need a crutch. That's the truth of the matter. You're mortal. All of us are mortal. And we need help in the sense that we need divine intervention, help from Jehovah. <laughs> so his, his rebuttal is no, God isn't a crutch because we all need crutches because we all need God. <laughs> this doesn't make sense. This doesn't make sense, folks. You know, I wish that I would have done this more when I was a witness. I'm just like, let me just like break down each individual thing he's saying. <laughs> Because it really doesn't hold up. Like he's really speaking purely from a place of emotion. And, and that's why I, I've, um, to make things about me, it's been about 30 seconds since I did that. You know, I've kind of been sitting on a script for a little bit about like how to have like conversations with Jehovah's Witnesses and break down their logic, right? Because I, it's something that is really interesting to me. Um, at this, but I, I kind of, I have to admit, I am growing suspicious that that's pointless. I'm growing kind of suspicious that, you know, it's valuable for people who are waking up, you know, for it's valuable for, for PMOs. It's valuable for people who are questioning, who want to interrogate that stuff already, but they're not making logical arguments. They are making emotional arguments. And when you look at uh, like my favorite thing that people post on the XJW Reddit is their text conversations that they have with their family and, and friends and elders and stuff. And, the, you know, our XJW friend is just spewing facts and logic, presenting it perfectly. And what does it fall back? What, what does the witness fall back on? It's never that. It's emotional. It's, well, I know it's the truth. Are you saying that I'm going to call her? I'm crazy. You're crazy. You know, it's all emotional. And that's what the broadcasts are. It's sad music playing behind some old person talking about all the things they sacrificed for Jehovah. It's a Caleb and Sophia cartoon. It's all emotion driven. And that's what this talk is. <laughs> all he is doing is saying, these think these guys think they're so great, but no, 
they're stupid and they're wrong and they're fleshly and really were the smart ones. Uh, and that's it. That's, that's all he's saying. He's not breaking down their logic in any way. So I don't know. I'm kind of, uh, let me know what you think about that. Should I make a video about breaking, like how to have critical conversations with witnesses? Because I, I have to admit, I I'm leaning towards rethinking it entirely towards like, what are the kind of emotional arguments you can make? Because I, I tend to think that that's really at the heart of the matter for, for most members these days. God, and he provides it through the ransom sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Sorry, so we're going we understand why the physical man this. acts the way he does. He shuts his eyes to the overwhelming facts of creation, the obvious intelligent design. Overwhelming facts. I will proceed to cite none of them, but we, you know what they are. Of DNA, the fine tuning of the forces, the four forces right evident there. in the universe, Earth's marvelous cycles that maintains it. Earth's mightiest the heroes. The precise the placement of Earth and the solar system. The wonderful symbiotic relationships in the plant and animal world and so much more that make it very obvious. No, 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 you fucking idiot. It's not obvious. There are gaps in your logic and <laughs> all of these things have explanations that are internally and broadly coherent, like... The field of biology can only exist because of evolution. It is the basis upon which everything like continues. It continues to reaffirm itself. We've never found evidence to overturn it. Only things that further prove its veracity, which is why they don't make arguments about specifics. He's making vague, broad claims about like he's literally doing look at the trees. Look at the fish. Aren't they so pretty? That's how you know there's God. Um, there are natural answers to these things, but he's not interested in investigating them in good faith. He just wants to broadly say people are stupid for not understanding when they see a fucking tree that an invisible guy named Jehovah wants to be your best friend. The wonderful, the marvelous intelligence that Jehovah God had exhibits in creation. But as 1 Corinthians 2.14 says... That is interesting that we he read used it. the word tuning because the fine-tuning argument is kind of that, like, evolu as far as I understand it, correct me if I'm wrong, I, I understand the fine-tuning article... Or Sorry, I just saw a comment and said the word article. The, the fine-tuning argument is that God did use evolution as a mean to fine-tune his creation. And witnesses do sort of believe in that because they believe in micro-evolution. Um, but I don't think they've ever necessarily use the term fine-tuning you know I, uh so interesting interesting to use that language a physical man does not accept the things of the spirit of god this is more us versus them by the way it's more we are spiritual men <laughs> even if you're a woman you're a man sorry and um there's us spiritual people and then in the world there's physical people and physical people are dumb idiots who lie and were tricked by stuff that we're not even going to tell you about. And they believe things are so crazy, I'm not even going to detail them. Just know they're wrong about everything, and you're right. So you just don't worry. Keep believing everything we're telling you. You're already right. Don't look any further. It's interesting. He looks at just the physical things, and yet it's the Spirit of God that created the wonderful physical things. But oh. he's blind because he can't see beyond them. It's like a man who admires a beautiful painting, a marvelous work of art, and he purchases it for his home. And he praises the artist. This is the, I, I mean, this literally is the argument from incredulity. That That's his entire tone and demeanor. These people think they can be nice and not worship our God, Jehovah, God, our God, Jehovah. Uh, yeah, it's exhausting. So I'm going to back it up so I hear this new ridiculous point he's making. This video is nine minutes long and it's taken me 45 minutes to go through it. Sorry. The spirit of God that created the wonderful physical things, but... He's blind because he can't see beyond them. It's like a man who admires a beautiful painting, a marvelous work of art, and he purchases it for his home, and he praises the artist. And then he wants to see the scene or the site where the artist did his work. So he goes to the mountains where the lakes are and the mountains are, the trees, the wildlife, and he observes these things and he is awestruck with their beauty. And he praises the artist. He doesn't say anything about the one who did the original. 
No oh, fucking hell. Okay. I thought he was going to make a totally different point. I thought he was going to I thought he was going to do the the blind watchmaker argument and say you would never think that a painting just evolved when I was going to say paintings cannot evolve by a you know they can't evolve by a natural process but life can. And but he is mad that people like artists because it's like, um, sorry, that painting of a sunset actually should have a little like it should have your signature. And then beneath it, it should have like a little like Jehovah Genesis one one. He created this uh, like this is absurd. You can't even enjoy art anymore because art sometimes represents real things. <laughs> I don't understand the point he's trying to make. He's blind. But look at that fucking that's smoke. That's how it is. Smile Spot on the his one face. who did the original. Mm, mm, he crushed it. He is feeling himself so hard right now. He's like, mm. checkmate atheists. He's blind. And that's how it is with a physical man. First Corinthians 2.15. Ooh, let's, hear, let's hear about it. That verse says, however, the spiritual man examines all things. But he himself is not examined by any man. Watch year one on stream sometime. I've never seen it. The spiritual man is not one who all day long wears a sanctimonious or religious expression on his face. That's good idea, Cubone. He's not like a self-righteous Pharisee. Yeah. The spiritual man is yeah, capable that's not what of Watch admitting when like, he makes a people mistake up with heavy on loads his face. And getting involved with the minutia of the law instead of the you know principle of grace and love and mercy. That's not what Jehovah's Witnesses do. Peace. He's not like a self-righteous Pharisee. The spiritual man is capable of admitting when he makes a mistake. His first thought is not to save face. Wow. But his first thought is really to be honest and open. He knows his creator can see everything and knows everything. What a fucking closer for this stream, by the way, because... <laughs> You know, what we looked at in the first hour was just example after example of Watchtower blatantly lying to the point where you can set it side by side with what it says on their own website and you can see the contradiction. And yet he's trying to say that spiritual men don't try and save face and admit their mistakes, a thing that the governing body literally never does. We are honest with ourselves and with others. And we deal with situations with modesty. Mm -hmm. And what is more, the spiritual man is able to see the wrong position of the physical man, the course of the physical man. We understand the mental attitude of the physical man. We know what makes him tick. Yeah, clearly. You gave so many specifics. However, the physical man does not understand the spiritual man. And just for a brief <sighs> explanation, 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17, which I won't read it. What they don't seem to understand is that uh, a lot of physical men were previously spiritual men who realized that spiritual men uh, fucking suck <laughs> and that they were wrong and they have perfectly valid and logical reasons for why they believe the way they believe or don't believe the way they believe. And just to really give a, you know, some condolences here, Kim, uh, I, the talk is dumb. This talk <laughs> is the dumb thing. If you can't follow it, it is because it is incomprehensible on any other level than vibes. You know, unless you were there in this morning worship vibing to the spiritual energy, this is nonsense. At this time. But it, this time. it gives a very brief description of the mental attitude and outlook of the physical man. Yeah. A fact that cannot be ignored also is that Christendom's churches, as well as all religions that are part of Babylon the Great, with their unscriptural teachings, unclean practices, and meddling in politics, uh -huh. have played a major role in driving people away from belief in the true God. They have a great responsibility before Jehovah God. Wow. Bloodlust. And also, it's not that people just don't like your religion. It's that they dislike every other religion and just think they like yours by mistake. Like, no, this this is one of the things that they would that they had in the reasoning book as like a to overcome a potential conversation stopper. Like, is it that you don't believe in God, or do you just not like religion because everyone other than my own religion is really bad? Uh, yeah, more. Nonsense. Because of the foolish 
ridiculous oh. things they teach Foolish, and their activities stupid, that dishonor Jehovah. They have stupid, driven people to atheism part, and stinky, agnosticism. Lame. So how good it is to know the true God, Jehovah, oh, so good. to have been drawn to him. And if you know the truth, you have been drawn to Jehovah God by his Holy Spirit, his invisible power that is so yeah, evident in all of creation, and particularly in his word, the Bible. Spiritual men and women can see the unseen. Mm -hmm. We know who created the heavens and the earth. You have superpowers and can see invisible things. I mean, not really, but you can kind of feel a general, general vibe, general feeling of godishness when you're hanging out at the Kingdom Hall. Well, folks, this has been a very long stream. Uh, I tended to keep it to two hours, went a little over time. I hope you enjoyed it. We had over 200 people viewing pretty consistently the entire time, and that is unbelievable. Thank you so much for supporting the channel. Uh, please do if you can. Uh, the live chat doesn't seem to contribute to the actual video in terms of like whether or not the algorithm suggests it to people. So if you want to leave comments, uh, subscribe if you haven't, and uh, do consider joining the Patreon. It's a lot of fun. Uh, we've got fun stuff coming up on the channel. Um, I have, I think the next thing I'll probably edit is a video I have filmed about the meanest JW comments I've gotten just because it's kind of a fun reprise after talking about some serious stuff. Um, but yeah, uh, I'm really enjoying making YouTube videos and stuff lately. I feel, feel into it. Feel, I feel really uh, energized. It's been really fun. So uh, please do like and subscribe and just continue being the best. And I got to think of a way to end these, but I don't have it yet. So I'm just going to play the intro again because it's funny. Walked in. There's Jake.